All right. So we are going to be looking at properties of definite integrals. Uh, we're going to use properties of definite integrals to find the area between curves, uh, solve applied problems involving definite integrals, and determine average value of a function. All right, theorem five. Say you've got three numbers, A, B, and C, where B is between A and C. For any number C that is between A and B, the integral from A to B is the integral from A to C plus the integral from C to B. So what I'm saying is, if I take one big interval and I'm integrating over this entire interval, I could also look at it as integrating from this point to this point and then that point to a different point and adding them together. Because we're really just talking about area, right? When we do definite integration, so it makes sense that if I just take one big region, break it up into two pieces, add this area plus this area, it's going to equal the total area. Okay? This is math speak. All it's basically saying is if I'm integrating from a low number to a high number, I can integrate from, in, from that bottom number to some number in the middle and then start at that middle and go to the top and make two different integrals. Okay? So we want to find the area under the graph of y equals f of x from negative, five, or negative 4 to 5 when we've got this piecewise function. Notice this piecewise function snaps in the middle, right? From negative 4 to 5, we've got this break here at 3. So we know that we could instead go from negative 4 to 3 and then 3 to 5. Okay, does that make sense? We're just splitting that big interval into two smaller intervals. Because I can't do a piecewise function from negative 4 to 5 because the pieces change. Okay, so anytime your function changes in the middle of your interval, you're going to have to break it up into multiple integrations. Okay, so if I want to find the area under the graph of 9, how do I do that? I just integrate 9, right, with respect to x. So 9 dx. Now what part of the interval from negative 4 to 5 can I integrate over? To 3, right? Because that's as far as that function goes is to 3. Then I'm going to integrate from 3 to 5 of the function that's actually on that interval, which is x squared. Does that make sense? Since it's a piecewise function that I'm going to have to integrate each piece over whatever part of the interval it's on. All right, so what's the integral of 9 dx? Nine x, right? And we're going to evaluate it from negative four to three. So that means we're going to plug in nine times three minus nine times negative four, or twenty-seven plus thirty-six, which is going to be sixty-three. And then x squared, what's the integral of x squared? Remember, we're going to add 1 and divide by that number. So x cubed over 3, evaluated from 5 to 3. So what's 5 cubed? 125 over 3 minus 3 cubed, 27 over 3. That's going to be 98 over 3. So if I want to add these two together, I get 63 plus 98 over 3, which gives me 287 thirds, which would be roughly 95 and 2 thirds. That would be exactly, actually, not roughly. Okay, now, does everybody see what I did? Is there anybody that's confused on this problem? I have to trust you. 
If you don't tell me, I don't know. Here's what the picture of that graph looks like. You could actually do this graph you know, geometrically if you wanted to. What if we want to find the area under the graph of y from negative 3 to 6? So let's just set this, don't solve it, let's just set it up. So our first integral is going to go from negative 3 to what? To 2. And what function are we integrating? The x squared, right? Because that's the part that's on the less than 2. And then since we went to 2, we're going to start at 2 and go to what? 6, right? Because that's what we're looking at from negative 3 to 6. And now we're going to integrate the second function. Okay? Any questions on how to set those up? No. Okay. The what? Right, because we're we're as we get close to it, it doesn't matter what, whether it's at that value or not. It could they could both be less than or greater than with no equal to at all, but the only reason that we have to have one of them equal to is because we need it to be a continuous function so we can integrate over the entire function. All right, so theorem six tells us that if we want the area between two curves, not just the area under a curve, but the area between two specific curves, then we're just going to take the total area of F, which is this part, right, the whole thing, and we're going to subtract off the area that's G, and that's just going to leave us the piece we want. So we just do F minus G. Remembering the hardest part of this one sometimes is figuring out which one's on top, which one is a bigger function. You know that if you get a negative answer, you pick the wrong one. You'll get a negative area if you pick the wrong one. So really it's not going to matter which one you think is on top and which one is not. But so let's look at the area bounded by the graphs of 2x plus 1 and x squared plus 1. I need to know where we're grounded from. Hold on. Okay. Yeah, so if you're, if you're not given a, a range, an interval, if we're just, it just says find the area that's bounded by the graphs. This means that they have to intersect at some point and create a bounded area. Okay? So, what we're looking at is we need to find where they're equal. They should be equal at least two points so that we can close the loop. So if we say 2x plus 1 equals x squared plus 1. Can I solve that equation? Sure, it's just quadratic, right? So I just need to get everything together on one side and factor it. So subtract 2x, subtract 1. So subtract 2x, subtract 1. Yup, yup. 0 equals x squared. The ones will cancel out, so minus 2x. Here we can factor out an x. Let's just put x minus 2. So we get x equals 0 and x equals 2. So this tells us where we're bounded from. So we're going to integrate from 0 to 2. We're going to assume in this case that 2x plus 1 is the f, the, the one that's on top. So we'll do f minus g. So 
that's going to be 2x plus 1 minus x squared plus 1 dx. So that's 2x plus 1 minus x squared minus 1 dx. Right, so the ones will cancel out, and you just have the integral of 2x minus x squared dx from 0 to 2. So we're going to integrate each piece separately. So what's the integral of 2x? Or just x squared. And then the integral of negative x squared, or the, uh, yeah, the integral of negative x squared, add 1, divided by 3. And we're going to evaluate this from 2 to 0. So we plug in 2, we get 4 minus 8 thirds. Plug in 0, you get 0, so minus 0. And we do that, we're going to get what? Four thirds? No. So that's the area of the region bounded by those two graphs, four thirds square units, whatever the units are. That's what the graph looks like. Alright, so Suppose we have a clever college student who develops an engine that's believed to meet all state standards for emission control. The new engine's rate of emission is given by the function E of t is equal to 2t squared. Okay, ET is, in is the emissions in billions of pollution particles per year at a time t in years. The emission rate of a conventional engine is given by 9 plus t squared. All right. This is what the graphs look like. The question is, at what point in time will the emission rates be the same? Well, we just set E equal to C, right? And we should be able to get that. So we're looking at what? 2t squared equals 9 plus t squared. So can we solve that? Well, sure. Let's subtract t squared. We get t squared equals 9. Well, if t squared equals 9, what's t? Mathematically, it would be plus or minus 3, but since we're talking about a time, we're not going to talk about time in the past. So after three years, the emission rates will be the same. Now, the reduction in emissions is represented by the area between those graphs, right? Because the area under the graph of the uh, E is how much pollution is created by the new emissions. The one under C is the old one. So if we subtract those pollutions, we should get how much we've reduced emissions, okay? So we're going to set it up. The graph from 0 to 3, because that's starting point to the point where they become the same, okay? So we've got F minus G, or in this case, C minus E. So 
So when we integrate that, we just get 9 minus 9t minus t cubed over 3. When we plug in 3 and 0, we get just 18. All right? Does everybody follow that? All right. So let's define the average value over an interval. The average value is just the total divided by however many units you have, right? That's the average. So we know that the total area is given by the integral. If we want to divide this area up into, you know, the average, we're going to have to divide by however many units we've gone. So that's what the one over b minus a is. b minus a is how far you went, and we're dividing by it. So this is the formula for average value. Just integrate it and divide by whatever the difference in your uh, interval is, or the length of your interval. So find the average value of x squared over the interval from 0 to 2. So we know that this is going to be the interval, inter, integral from 0 to 2 of x squared. And we're going to divide by b minus a, which is 1 over 2 minus 0. So we put a 1 half out front. So what is x squared integrated? x cubed over 3 from 0 to 2. So it's going to be 1 half times 8 thirds minus 0. One over b minus a. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that Rico's speed in miles per hour, t minutes after he's entered the freeway, is given by this function. Negative 1 over 200 t cubed plus 3 over 20 t squared minus 3 over 8 t plus 60. And this is true for the first 30 minutes. So t is less than or equal to 30. From 5 minutes after entering the freeway to 25 minutes, what was Rico's average speed? Okay? So let's start by finding that average speed. And then after we find the average speed, we'll say how far did he travel over that time interval. So we know that the average speed is going to be 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of the function, right? So we just 1 over b minus a, so 25 minus 5. So we're going to have 1 over 20 out front. We're integrating from 5 to 25. That's the, what they gave us in the problem. And then we're going to integrate the function. So we're going to integrate negative 1 over 200 t cubed. What do we get? For who? For me? I'd prefer you didn't. Yeah. All right, so t cubed, so we're going to raise it to the fourth power and divide by 4, right? So that's going to put a 4 in the denominator. So that's going to be negative 1 over 200 times t to the fourth over 4, right? 
you want to do it separately, you can do it like that. Plus, you've got 3 over 20. t squared becomes t cubed over 3, right? Minus 3 eighths. t becomes t squared over 2. Plus 60 becomes what? 60t. And we're integrating from 5 to 25. So this is going to give us 1 over 20. This is going to be t to the fourth over 800 plus 3t cubed over uh, let's just do t cubed over 20. Right, because the 3s will cancel out. Minus 3t squared over 16 plus 60t from 25 to 5. That cleans it up a little bit. All right, so let's plug in 25. So we're going to have negative 25 to the fourth power. What's 25 to the fourth power? Yeah, you don't have to use a calculator. Somebody just spouts that out at me. I'll be really impressed. Okay, over 800. Plus, what's 25 cubed? over 20 minus 3 times 25 squared over 16 plus 60 times 25 all right minus now we got to plug in 5 so what's negative, what's 5 to the 4th power? So it's 25 over 800. And what's 5 cubed? 125 over tw 20. 3 times t squared. And 60 times 5. All right, my head hurts. These numbers are too big. Negative three six three hundred ninety six twenty five divided by eight hundred plus fifteen six twenty five divided by twenty minus eighteen seventy five divided by sixteen plus fifteen hundred. That's fifty three six twenty five over thirty two. Minus negative 625 divided by 800 plus 125 divided by 20 minus 75 divided by 16 plus 300. 9625 over 32. That's 1 over 20 times. 1,375, which gives us 275 over 4. This is going to be an exercise in keeping everything straight. So what does that represent? So that's going to be roughly 68.75 miles per hour. That sounds reasonable. Now, if you'd have gotten 743.29, probably didn't do something right, right? You use your answer, ask yourself, does it logically make sense? If it makes sense, then you know you're at least in the ballpark, maybe. It's no guarantee that it's right, but it is at least in 
you know, you didn't do something drastically wrong, right? Now, if that's the average speed, how far did he go during that time? So how do we figure that out? How long did he go? How long was he driving? Twenty. He went from five to twenty-five, right? That's a span of twenty minutes. So how many how many miles? I mean, how many hours is twenty minutes? It's one third of an hour, right? So if I'm going 68.75 miles per hour for one third of an hour, how far have I gone? Roughly 23 miles. Okay, does everybody get where I got that from? So we know we're going 68.75 miles per hour. We were talking about the, the interval from 5 minutes to 25 minutes. So that means we only went 20 minutes. Okay. How many mile or how many hours is 20 minutes it's a third of an hour right because I can look at this as saying there's one hour in 60 minutes the minutes will cancel out I get 20 over 60 hours which is one third of an hour using dimensional analysis okay so to find how far you've gone you multiply how fast you're going by how long you went so 68.75 miles in one hour times one-third of an hour. The hours cancel out. You get 68.75 divided by 3, which is roughly 23. And the only unit I have left is miles, so it's got to be miles. Does that make sense? Twenty-two and eleven twenty-second miles. That's a little exact. I'm just going to walk through this one. We're not going to actually do it because it's big numbers again. But uh, say we've got the temperature in degrees in Minneapolis on a winter's day, modeled by this function. X in this case is the number of hours from midnight. Okay. So zero has to, or, uh, x has to be between 0 and 24. Because at 0, we are at midnight. At 24, we're at midnight. Okay. So let's find the average temperature during that 24-hour period. So what's 1 over b minus a? One over 24, right? B minus a is just 24. So I know it's going to be set up as 1 over 24. We're integrating from what to what? From 0 to 24. We're integrating the function. Negative 0.012x cubed plus 0.38x squared minus 1.99x minus 10.1. Right? So when we do that, the beauty of this one is since we're at 0, we don't have to do the second part, you know, we only have to do the 24 because everything has an X in it. So when we do that, it's kind of cool. You could really, since you're going to 24, you could cancel that out and make that a cubed, make that a square, make that of the first, and get rid of that. And then you wouldn't have a fraction. But that's just something I would do. Not something you have to do. Sorry, CBS just told me some interesting sports facts. So you get negative 2.5. So the average temperature on a given day in Minneapolis is negative 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit. 
That sounds yeah, sounds reasonable, right? No dead of winter. All right, so what do we do here? We have an additive property, which means if we add them together, it's the same thing as taking the total. I mean, it's just addition, right? Uh, as long as we're summing over a non-broken interval. So if we're talking about from A to B, we can go from A to C and C to B. Okay, everybody's good with that. All right? The area of a region bounded by two graphs is just the top graph minus the bottom graph from whatever interval we're looking at. If it's bounded, that means they're equal at certain points. We can just set the two functions equal to each other to find those boundary points. But we're still going to integrate from A to B. And then lastly, the average value of a function is 1 over B minus A integrated from A to B of that function. Okay? Any questions? about any of that right now. When you work on the homework, ask questions and let me know, okay? Now, we want to talk about a new method of integration called substitution. We want to be able to evaluate integrals using substitution and solve applied problems involving it. So here are some things that we're going to do. We're going to look at what if we don't have x to the r or e to the x or 1 over x? What if we've got a function to a power or e to a function or 1 over a function? Okay. We have to be able to equate these back to the forms that we know, back to x to the r, where we can do power rule on it, or e to the r, or e to the x, I'm sorry, where we can just use the, the basic uh, formula for doing an exponential. What we need to do is do a substitution, okay? Now, we know that if y is equal to x cubed, we want to find dy. How do we find dy? That's just the derivative of y. So what's the derivative of x cubed? Derivative, not integration. 3x squared, right? OK. Therefore, dy, we have to think of this as being kind of as being kind of like division. This is not division in its truest sense, but we can pretend like it is and do the same kind of thing. If we want dy, we want just the numerator, we get rid of the denominator by multiplying both sides by dx, right? So we get dy is equal to 3x squared dx. Okay? Does that make sense? How you're looking at the derivative is just dy over dx. But if I just want dy, I have to move that dx over. Now, if u is equal to x to the 2 thirds, what is du? That u dx, the derivative of u with respect to x, is going to be 2 thirds x to the negative 1 third. So I multiply both sides by dx, I get du equals 2 over 3x to the third dx. For du, yes. All right, if y is equal to e to the x squared, find dy. Well, we know that dy dx of e to the x squared is e to the x squared, and then the derivative of x squared, which is 2x. So to get dy, we multiply both sides by dx. 
2x e to the x squared dx. All right. What is dy for a? Close. Close. What are you missing? No negative. Well, there's a negative, but you moved it to the bottom, so it became positive. What about the 2? Shouldn't it be 1 over 2 square root of x? Yeah. Because this is x to the 1 half, right? So that's going to be 1 half x to the negative 1 half which is going to be 1 over 2 square root of x, and then the dx. What about 1 over x cubed? That's going to be negative 3 over x to the fourth dx. Is that right? All right, what about C, x squared minus 3x? Make sure to put the 2x minus 3 in parentheses. And then for d, right, it'd just be 4dx, right? Okay, so really all we're doing is taking the derivative and tacking that dx onto the end. Okay? All right. Now we're going to be able to do some really powerful integrations. Say we want to evaluate 3x squared times x cubed plus 1 to the 10th power. Now, I can do this by the methods that I know if I foil x cubed plus 1 to the 10th power out. Right? Because that's just going to give me a polynomial. And I just do it one piece. It's going to be a really long polynomial. It's going to take me a while to do it. But I can do it with the methods I know. But I don't want to do that because it's going to take forever. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at doing a substitution. And generally when we do substitutions, we do a substitution of the function that's in parentheses or under a radical or in the denominator you know, these functions that are in specific places, that are inside of other functions, okay? So if I have x cubed plus 1 to the 10th power, that means the function inside is x cubed plus 1. So I'm going to do what's called a u substitution. I'm going to say u is equal to x cubed plus 1. Now I'm going to solve it by doing this substitution, but I have, I'm, I'm changing my variable from x to u which means I need to change my dx to du. Well, to find du, I just take the derivative of x cubed plus 1. What's that going to be? 3x squared, and I tack the dx on. This means that for me to substitute du into my problem, I have to have 3x squared dx. Do I have a 3x squared and a dx?
Notice I have a 3x squared dx. So I can take that 3x squared dx, put it together, the x cubed plus 1 becomes u to the 10th power du. If that is too abstract for you, if you're having difficulty seeing, I'm going to make the 3x squared dx into du somehow, take this, and since I'm substituting this for u, is there anything I can just substitute dx for? Can I solve this just for dx? Sure, just divide both sides by 3x squared. So you get dx equals du over 3x squared. So now I can substitute in. I've got the 3x squared there. x cubed plus 1 becomes u to the 10th, and dx is du over 3x squared. So the 3x squareds will cancel out, and you just have u to the 10th du. Either one of those methods works. And a lot of times, solving for dx can be a little more advantageous if you have to add things. Like later, we'll sh I'll show you when, what I'm talking about, but sometimes that becomes a little bit better to solve it that way. All right, so what's the integral of u to the 10th? u to the 11 over 11. What am I missing? plus c. Remember, this is an indefinite integral. We've got to have the plus c. Now, I started in x, so I need to end in x. So I'm going to back substitute. I know that u is equal to x cubed plus 1, so that's just x cubed plus 1 to the 11th power over 11 plus c. And there's my final answer. Now, can we check this by taking the derivative and seeing if we get back to that function? Not only can we, we should. Okay, So let's derive this. Let's take the derivative. So bring the 11 out front. The 11s will cancel out. You're left with x cubed plus 1, subtract 1, so to the 10th power, and then times the derivative of what's inside. The derivative of x cubed plus 1 is 3x squared. That gets us back to this. So we know we did it right. This takes practice. Okay? You're not going to become a master of u substitution you know, by working two or three problems. It really takes getting in there and doing multiple problems. So we have the integral of 4x times 2x squared plus 3 to the third power. What are we going to do substitution on? What's u going to be equal to? The 2x squared plus 3. It's whatever's in the parentheses, right? This doesn't always work either. Now, this is just a step to see if we can use u substitution. So u is equal to 2x squared plus 3 then what is du going to be equal to? It's 4x dx, right? Do I have 4x dx? Yes. Okay. Or I can solve it for dx. And say that dx is equal to du over 4x so that I get 4x times u cubed times du over 4x, so the 4x's will cancel out, and I just have u cubed du. So what's the integral of u cubed? But I'm going to back substitute now, and u was 2x squared plus 
this is the heart of use substitution, and this is the most powerful tool that we do in calculus because we use it all the time. Very seldom do you get just a straight polynomial that you need to integrate. Most of the time, it's a much more complicated function. Okay, there are other techniques that we'll use, but this one, we may not use them. This is going to be our primary. Actually, I don't. I think this may be the only one that we learn. So. It's really important for this class because it's the only integration technique that we learn, okay? All right, so let's evaluate 2x dx over 1 plus x squared. So we've got a fraction. So that means I need to try to do what? What am I going to let u be? Remember when I started, I said we need to do things in parentheses, things under radicals, and denominators. Those are going to be the first three things that we always try. We don't have any parentheses. We don't have any square roots. Do we have a fraction? Yes, we've got a denominator. So I'm going to let u be 1 plus x squared. So if that's the case, what is du? Two x dx. Do I have two x dx? Oh, not only do I have it, it's just sitting there beautifully. So I can do a straight substitution, du over u. Well, what's the integral of, or if you'd prefer, 1 over u du. It may be better for you at this point to see it that way because we know what the integral of 1 over u is. What is the integral of 1 over u? Do you remember? What can we derive, what can we take the derivative of and get 1 over x? Natural log, right? So the integral of 1 over u is natural log absolute value of u plus c. Now, we do our back substitution. U is 1 plus x squared. Is 1 plus x squared ever negative? No, so I don't have to worry about leaving the absolute values. So I can say natural log of 1 plus x squared plus c. If you forget that little check of is it going to be positive, is it if, if you leave the absolute values, it's still right, okay? So if you're ever in question as to whether or not something becomes positive or is always positive, just leave it as absolute values. Same type of deal. Here we've got parentheses and a denominator. Hey. If you've got parentheses, that's your first thing you're going to think of to try to use. Okay? So, what's my u? 1 plus x squared. Therefore, du, once again, 2x dx. So that gives me the integral of du over u squared. But isn't that just u to the negative 2 du? So let's integrate that. What's the integral of u to the negative 2? Add 1 and divide by that number. So u to the negative 1 divided by negative 1, so negative. 1 over u. We do our back substitution. Change the u to 1 plus x squared. Am 
All right. Here we've got the natural log of 3x dx over x. Now, this one doesn't fit our normal first three things we try. Because if I let u be x, du is just dx. It doesn't really do anything. If I let u be 3x, then I get that du would be 3dx. I still have this x in the denominator that I, that I can't get rid of. Okay, so the question becomes, what to do? Well, what's the only other function that I have? I have the natural log of 3x, okay? So, let's try letting u be the natural log of 3x. So what's du going to be? What's the derivative of natural log 3x? It's the derivative of what's inside the parentheses, which is what? 3 over what's in the parentheses. So 3 over 3x dx, which is just 1 over x dx. Do I have a 1 over x? Well, sure, I've got that x in the denominator. That's the same thing as saying 1 over x times natural log of 3x dx, right? There's no difference in that, just how it's written. Because the top is the derivative of 3x, the bottom is just 3x. Because the. So, what's another thing I could do? I could solve, if I've got du equals 1 over x dx, I can solve for dx by multiplying both sides by x, right? So I get dx equals x du. And if you do this, it may be easier to see that your x is going to cancel out because we can say ln 3x is just u, dx is x du and then over x. So we can see that the x's cancel out and we just have the integral of, d, of u du. So what's the integral of u? No? Remember, add 1, so that becomes u squared divided by 2. And we're going to plug our u back in. And that'll be the final answer. Substitution problems are fun because they become like little puzzles. You're like, well, what am I going to let you be? Sometimes you have to play around with them until you figure out exactly what you is going to be. Now, here we have one that's a little bit tweaked. If we can let natural log you know, be our function. Now we have to look at e to the x squared. What can I let my u be? Well, notice that if I have x squared, if I think, because remember, we always think about 
e to the u, natural log of u, u to the n, uh, you know, u prime over u, you know, all these different, I don't know why I keep writing stuff, but we can let u be e to the x squared. We can let u just be x squared. You know, there are different things we can look at because e to the x squared is a function, right? But x squared is a function. So which one in this case do we need to do? Well, I know I can integrate e to the u, so I can just let u be x squared and see what happens, okay? Well, let me ask you a question. Let's, di let's take a tangent for a second. If I let u be e to the x squared, then the derivative of that would be e to the x squared times 2x. If I pull the e to the x squared out, this is so poor that I should have a dx there, uh, I can do this. There's no problem with this because All I'm saying is I have an e to the x squared, right? I have an x. The only thing I'm missing is a 2. And that's cool because if all you're missing is a constant, you can put a constant there. If I multiply that whole equation by 2, what else would I have to multiply it by so that I don't change anything? If you multiply something by 2, could you multiply it by one half and have the twos cancel each other out and not really change anything? Yeah, so as long as you multiply by a number and then also multiply by the reciprocal of that number, you're okay. So if I want to take this and multiply that by two, if the two I multiplied on the inside, on the outside I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal. Okay, so e to the x squared 2x dx, that's exactly what I have. So I'm just going to change that to du. So that's basically like saying the integral of 1 du. And what's the integral of 1 du? not du, just u, right? Because the integral of 1 is just x, so the integral of u would be just u, or the integral of 1 would be just u if you're doing it with respect to u. So this is 1 half times u. But u is e to the x squared, so 1 over 2 e to the x squared, don't forget your plus c. Now let's go back and do this problem again. This time just let u be x squared. If u is x squared, what is du? Two x dx. Well, once again, I've got the x, but I don't have 2x, so I can say and see that I've got the 2x dx, and I've got e to the u, so this is going to be 1 half e to the u du. But what's the integral of e to the u? It's just e to the u, right? So back substitute our u, we get 1 half e to the x squared plus c. Same thing. Notice we did two different u substitutions, but we wound up with the same answer. Because it doesn't matter what you let u be, 
as long as you can get rid of your dx and substitute your dx with a du and not have any x's left. Okay? All right. We will start with definite integration on Wednesday.